right. Good afternoon, everyone. So as we continue our deep dive conversation, we're going to talk a little bit about housing, an uh, issue that's near and dear uh, to my heart. Uh, but it's not one that's not without challenges. Uh, in the first part of the last century, we had legal policies of redlining and segregation that limited uh, housing options uh, that people had. Uh, we had uh, a lack of financing for people who wanted to buy homes in neighborhoods uh, that could serve their families and their legacy well. Now, the Fair Housing Act in 1968 uh, overt, banned overt forms of discrimination, but some of those patterns continued. Uh, and uh, if, frankly, if we had solved it then, this would have been a very short panel. Uh, but some of those problems still continue to today. We still have uh, banks that are uh, being, uh, that they're uh, having redlining settlements. We have communities that have enacted zoning and other policies that have limited the variety of housing options and uh, valuations can differ by race. So we've got a lot of challenges that persist even uh, to the day. And simultaneously, we've talked today about wealth gaps that have persisted and market forces that provide their own challenges uh, for homeowners and those uh, that want to have stable housing, uh, rising interest rates, uh, and all of these factors and more really inhibit the ability of people to find housing options uh, that meet their needs. It's really a, a multiple part challenge. Uh, in my home community, uh, in Prince George's County, Maryland, a largely African-American community, homeowners who bought in the mid 2000s, 2006 or so, are only now uh, reaching the same property valuation that they had then. So that lack of stability uh, can really trickle down into all of the decisions that folks are making. Uh, the bottom line on the home ownership side is that uh, homeowners, back home ownership peaked at around 50% in 2004. Uh, by 2022, that had fallen to 45%. And the white home ownership rate remains 29 points higher than that. And so that amount is actually higher than before uh, the Fair Housing Act and other policies were implemented. So these are persistent challenges that we have. Uh, but we have a great panel of experts that I'm looking forward to having a great conversation with about some of the solutions. And so I'll start with this question to all of you. Uh, that we know because of the history of systemic and structural barriers, home ownership has not to date been that driver of black generational wealth creation in the same way that it's been uh, for white Americans. So what should we think about the role of home ownership and accessibility to other forms of housing more broadly as a viable solution for growing black wealth? So first of all, thank you. Uh, it's a real honor to be included here today. A um, couple of first thoughts. Um, uh, my colleagues at Urban have modeled the uh, next 30 years of home ownership patterns. And if we don't intervene, those numbers you just described are likely to get worse. In other words, the rate of black home ownership is on a trajectory that is likely to continue to decline. And that is, has all kinds of consequences. We're in the wealth pillar today of wages, wealth, uh, and work. And um, the reality is that for most Americans, uh, home ownership is the primary means by which they have acquired their wealth. Um, if we're caring about the wealth of black families through housing, we have to worry about um, things like rental housing, and we're going to talk about that later because the extraordinary mismatch of supply and demand and the lack of access to people are paying such a high percentage of their income for rent that savings uh, becomes uh, impossible to imagine and home ownership becomes further and further away. But even still, we know that intergenerational wealth is one of the primary ways in which people get their first step in the housing ladder. And sort of my argument is that rather than suggest, and I've heard, we, I have this debate all the time, rather than suggest that because homeownership does not, has not historically provided the same wealth accumulation patterns for black families as white, that we should instead steer people to other forms of uh, investment in savings. Um, and my answer is that unfortunately you're gonna find the same structural barriers that mean that for example, retirement savings doesn't produce as much wealth for black families as it does for white families either because they tend to be um, on, at, get less tax subsidy in the way that we've designed our retirement savings subsidies programs. In other words, we, what we really have to do is in the area of retirement savings and in, in the area of housing, we need to target the structural and system uh, problems that are creating the barriers that mean that black homeownership doesn't create as much wealth as white homeownership has. Um, 
Charles told us we're in solutions, so I could spend a lot of my time talking about why all those problems exist. But let me mention two possible solutions uh, to um, policies that are designed specifically to target structures um, that are limiting access. The biggest issue for black access to home ownership is down payment, accumulation, intergenerational wealth. If you don't have it to start, um, that's the biggest barrier. People have a hard time accumulating th the kind of size you need. The Biden administration has a proposal called um, the uh, First Generation Home Ownership Down Payment Assistance Act, $10 billion on the mandatory side. I'm, I'm proud of this because my colleagues played a critical role in designing. We modeled four different ways of measuring who is a first generation home buyer, depending upon what you look at about families. Were you ever, did they ever own a home? Did they not own a home in a certain period of time, et cetera? And we designed this um, uh, down payment assistance program so that it was um, aimed to maximize the extent to which it reached black and brown homeowners. And um, that policy, which was in a Build Back Better and is now in the president's budget, uh, could result in um, a whole sort of generation skipping problem, right? If you think about where 10 billion will go, that's real money. Similarly, I think if you are thinking about um, one of the other critical ways in which black homeownership does not create the same wealth, it's because people who own their homes uh, don't get the same degree of appreciation. And so much of that comes from the fact that we don't make our investments in the neighborhoods in the same way. Society has, um, you know, your property is worth more if there's a great park across the street, if the schools in the neighborhood are good, if there's NGOs, if there's food access, all those other things. So being very intentional about what we think of as community assets and making sure that those assets are sticky, meaning that they stay in the neighborhood um, so that you don't end up with displacement, so that the minute investment comes in, um, uh, black folks are pushed out of the neighborhood and the most of the accumulation comes to white. So there are strategies that are being used in cities around the country that are designed to improve the extent to which black home ownership ends up resulting in wealth accumulation. And we need to be mindful on the front end getting in and also then once people own homes. Yeah, that's great. Targeted solution for the systemic problems. Brika? Um, so thank you for having me. Thank you, BEA and Samantha. Um, uh, my name is Barika Williams. I'm the executive director of the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, or ANHD, which is based here in New York City. And we specifically policy research, also advocacy. So um, in keeping with my um, advocacy hat, I'm going to channel um, Pastor Howard John Restley down in Alfred Street Baptist Church and say, can I push it? So I'm going to push us a little, um, which is, you know, we have to, when we're having this housing conversation, remember what we're rooted in, right? And and recognize where we're starting from, which you, you started with a little bit, Rodney, of um, our white counterparts who have created tremendous amount of wealth in housing did so by taking, denying, getting, gaining, and sometimes stealing um, housing, land, and property at various different points in time in history. And we're talking about going back to, right, obviously Native American land, think about Seneca Village right here in, which is formerly Central Park, um, now Central Park, all the way to current day when we're thinking about eminent domain and deed theft, right? This is an ongoing um, uh, continuum and situation that we have to recognize that we're contending with around housing as black people and black communities. Um, and so to, to Sarah's point, I think one of the things that we've got to recognize is that this housing solution and the housing issue is both community-based and has to intersect with other forms of wealth accumulation and maintaining and keeping wealth that we are not going to end up in the same place as folks who gained acreage of property when nobody's giving us property now, right? Minus California recently in a beach, but that doesn't happen in mass, right? Um, and so we're not, we're not in the same game. Like we've talked about basketball earlier today. We've, we're playing, this is not two teams both in the NCAA tournament. This is like different sets of things that are happening. Um, and so we actually fundamentally need to be having some very different conversations when it comes to housing. And I think, as, as Sarah said, a key piece of this is neighborhoods, right? And that what we see and what we are confronting here in New York City, but really now our sister and brother aid um, organizations and groups across the country really understand is an issue around gentrification and displacement. 
that whether you're a renter or a homeowner, whether you're low income or higher income, everybody who is in certain black neighborhoods is feeling a tremendous amount of pressure of being priced out and pushed out, right? And so that is a different conversation because Yes, I may be a black homeowner who has achieved a certain amount of stability, has been able to purchase a home, but if I'm being pushed out of my location, where am I going? What is the neighborhood that I'm going to? What are the schools look like? What's the crime rates look like? And that's the same question for the low income renter, right? Who doesn't have a place to go in the event that they lose the unit that they're in or in the event that they need to shift to another type of unit. You have a new child. You have somebody else who's come into your home, right? We've just gone through and still are in COVID. You need to bring in a parent and care for somebody else in your family. We have to think about creating a housing system where we can allow people to be mobile and flexible in where they're headed, but also be stable as Black people and create wealth at the same time. And what we haven't done is sort of put those pieces together, right? We've had conversations about affordability, and we've had conversations about neighborhood investment, and then we've had conversations about rental housing, um, but we haven't understood how all of these things are fitting together. Um, and I think this is one of the solutions that we really need to be looking to. And quite frankly, um, Urban Institute has done a bunch of research around how little investment we actually put into neighborhoods um, especially around things like community development and neighborhood investments, compared to how much capital is actually flowing into these neighborhoods, right? We can't outcompete with all of the capital that is coming into a neighborhood like Crown Heights. And so the, the perspective that Crown Heights is going to stay black over time is just, it's, it's just a losing battle, unfortunately, right? I see folks being like, absolutely not, right? Um, and so, but we can't afford to lose these battles neighborhood by neighborhood, city by city across the country. Because fundamentally, we're gonna go back to a question of, well, where do we go? Where are we, right? And we need places not just to live, but places to be in community and to be in fellowship. Um, and so our housing conversations that we've been having are, right, are around, we've gotta be thinking about new solutions. Some of the, the, the problem is not the same problem that it was 40 years ago. We have a different challenge. And so we actually need to be ideating and innovating around a different set of solutions and tools. Yeah, housing options are definitely neighborhood based. We need the options in what I would call livable communities and certainly the impacts over time is something I think you really hit on as well, that these uh, impacts uh, are different than they may be for other economic assets. So your neighborhood over time really impacts you. Uh, so let's go on to uh, Margaret to see if you have thoughts on this. First and foremost, thank you so much to everyone at BEA for putting this, this event. It is, I'm excited to talk about solutions. I'm excited to be on this panel, but I'm also just excited to be in this room with all <laughs> of you and just I, everyone in the stage and the crowd could be on the panel and it's just, it's a nice environment, so thank you. Um, so my name is Margaret Anadu. I lead uh, real estate at the Vistria Group and just prior to this, I spent 20 years investing in housing, affordable, mixed income and other forms at, at Goldman. So it will not be surprising what I think one of the key solutions is, of affordable housing. So, you know, my, my co-panelists have talked a lot about kind of the home ownership side of the equation. And when I think about you know, wealth and black Americans and housing more broadly, because of the issues that have sort of kept our community from having home ownership at the same rates as others, right, definitionally we are disproportionately renters, um, uh, especially black women, and disproportionately rent burdened. So the majority, not just a significant portion, the majority of black Americans in this country not only are renters, but are not just rent burdened, meaning they're spending over a third of their income on rent, but are actually severely rent burdened. So spending over 50% of their income on rent. And that's important, not just for this you know, housing and wealth conversation, but to broaden it out to work and wages. When you are spending that much of your income on rent, you're not investing in your education. You're not investing on the things that would provide you with positive health outcomes. You are um, not investing in entrepreneurship, certainly. And so there's just this vicious cycle of how all these things interact and really prevents you from all of the things that would drive economic mobility for our, for our community. And when I think about solutions, because again, taking Charles' advice, we are not just gonna be complainers up here. <laughs> when I think about solutions, and I know we'll get into the, the, the private sector aspect of this, but just from a policy perspective, we need to fund more affordable housing. We need to invest more in affordable housing. We need to protect and hold the affordable housing that we have 
Because when you think about just the pure math of the situation, the land cost, labor cost, and construction cost that it requires to build new housing is not going to yield at any cost of capital housing that is affordable for the median, first of all, let alone American in this country to own or sort of rent than black Americans. And so there are no solutions to this issue that are not both private sector driven and public sector driven. And so I will say one you know, positive thing that we've been seeing around the country, when you look at the, the pure supply demand imbalance that we would need to sort of, if we could snap our fingers overnight and build enough units to sort of equalize that demand and you'll get different estimates, but it's roughly 7 million units. Against that 7 million unit hole, we build about 100,000 units a year. It's a drop in the bucket. And against that 100,000 units that we build every year, we lose more to obsolescence and we lose even more to loss of restriction. So this is a scenario where we're not even making progress. We're not even running in place. We're moving backwards. And so the solution has to be at all ends. It's not just about building more housing. It's not just about protecting our income restricted affordable housing, but what can we do with our market rate naturally occurring affordable housing, which is what most low-income black Americans live in the US. They're not in public housing. They're not in Section 8. They're not in housing where they have any regulatory protect protections. They are in existing class B and C, multifamily, spread across the country that to Brika's point about gentrification, they have the least protection. They could be kicked out, their rents increased at any moment. And so we are seeing some municipalities around the country, this one will surprise you, Texas, is actually a leader in this one, providing private sector incentives to take existing naturally occurring affordable housing and convert it to affordable in exchange for tax abatements or different regulatory incentives. But what's great about that solution is that it's quick, right? It's not all of the zoning and time and approvals that we, we especially <laughs> in our lives have dealt through on, on I'm looking at Colvin. You know, sometimes we spend years to get these new construction deals done. And so when you can have the right regulatory incentives to take existing housing and protect tenants where we have them in place, it's a solution we're seeing more and more around the country and it is incredibly effective. So you started to talk about this a little bit, but uh, the role of the public and private sector, but what does it look like for private investment to lean into that sub creating supply of uh, accessible housing options? I mean, are there more you could say about oh, how that sure. you've been able to do that in your career? Yeah, it's, it's funny that you said lean in. Um, private sector capital is not invested in this space really at all. So if we just, let me, just some numbers to kind of paint the picture. So what, 120, 125 million households in the US, 40 to 45 million of them are renters. Half of that renter population is rent burden. So this is not, this is not a small group of people. What, what we do and what we focus on affordable housing is not, it's not this niche, tiny sector. And we think about that from a numbers perspective, we think about affordable and workforce housing, again, what we need to support black Americans and black communities. We're talking four trillion of asset value. We're talking 50 billion on the low end, 150 billion on the high end that trades every single year. And I couldn't name on, actually I could with less than one hand, the number of institutional vehicles that are invested in this space. And real estate, largest asset class in the world, U.S. real estate alone, largest asset class in the world, residential real estate, the largest asset class in the world. So the incredible mismatch we have between actual capital that flows towards affordable housing and workforce housing, it's not enough. We, and I know you're gonna talk about this later. We have mission-driven real estate operators. We have impact investing vehicles, and I love impact investing, so I'm not, I'm not sort of being negative about it all, but we need every single allocator literally in the country and in the world who is invested in residential real estate to also focus on this segment of the population. There's not enough capital that flows to the space. So my, my first solution is actually just for every real estate allocator, public pensions, sovereigns, high net worth, need to stop ignoring this part of the market because it's not just an issue about the impacts that we wanna have for you know, all Americans, but certainly black Americans it's a commercial opportunity that people just don't see because the flip side of that supply demand imbalance is incredibly stable and resilient cash flows that the majority of our you know, capital allocating ecosystem just does not appreciate. 
Well, part of what you said, I think, tees up Verika well to talk about the role of mission-driven organizations, given the range of this problem and the need to have a focus. Uh, how can mission-driven organizations really play a role at solving some of this challenge we're talking about? Yeah, so um, I'm going to double-click on a lot of what Margaret said. Um, because uh, so the folks who have started, who started doing this affordable housing development, the early actors in this space were mission-driven developers. They were nonprofit organizations. The market wasn't necessarily doing this, and they found a way, literally, Colvin, OG, first, first CDC in, in um, America, um, here in, in Brooklyn in Bed-Stuy, um, to do this, said, we're going to figure out how to do this ourselves, right? And so this is, this is our, our 40, 50-year arc of where we are now. Um, but as things have changed, as our neighborhoods have shifted, as the markets have shifted, um, it, we have really run into a place where we are struggling to catch up when it comes to access to capital and the ability to, to, um, to make these projects um, come to fruition, right? It is a currently six month to a year and a half process. If you have an affordable housing building already and you need a capital repair or improvement, you're like, I need a new boiler. I need to repair my roof. That's how long it takes for government to figure this out with you right now. So I think there's this fundamental mismatch when we understand that these mission-driven developers and asset holders are the ones that are really protecting and oftentimes preserving this critical affordable housing stock in our Black communities, right? They are going through and figuring out the housing lottery. Also keep in mind that Oftentimes, real estate is a piece of what they are doing. I got my COVID tested, one of these groups, right? I got my vaccinations. We got calls where the city government was like, oh, we realized community groups that are actually rooted in these neighborhoods are your members, and that's not who we've been connected to. So how can we get to emergency food service delivery? How can we get vaccinations out with community-based validators? And those were the organizations that could do this. So we need to invest in them for a multitude of reasons. Um, and instead, in housing right now, they are being condensed and contained and really compartmentalized in the broader housing market. They are becoming a shrinking share and a shrinking portion. Um, and what that means is we are losing out on affordability that specifically speaks to black populations, right? And I think we forget that on average, when we really look at who the black population is, that we are much lower income. Doesn't mean lower class because black middle class and white middle class are necessarily the same thing, but lower income, especially when it comes to housing than people recognize. The average household income, not individual, Household income for a white household in New York City is about $92,000. For a black household, that's down around 55. Household income, folks, right? So if we're putting up brand new market rate housing units that on average in New York City are hitting $2,700 for a two bedroom rent, half of that population is a no-go. They are not accessing that unit at all, right? So what we, I, I think, a key part of mission-driven development, a key part of what, what Margaret talked about is we need people to be socially equity, racially conscious about what we are creating in supply so that we are creating the housing that black folks actually need and can access on the home ownership side and on the rental side. So in terms of solutions, I think the, a solution is for folks in here to really Take a moment and opportunity to say, how can I support one of these organizations? What can I do to figure out partnering with bed Restoration? How can I help um, West Harlem Group Assistance, right? There are groups across the country who are doing this work and are really struggling to, to be able to grow and thrive, to do the projects that they know their communities need, to figure out creating a brand new library on the ground floor and residential affordable housing up top, which just happened in Sunset Park and is getting ready to happen in Inwood. That's a six year project just for them to say, we're gonna figure out how to do this, let alone to build it, right? We can't, our, we can't wait that long. And so there's an opportunity for all of us to really get together and say, how can we support and provide more resources, investment, um, equity, and capacity for these types of organizations to do their work? All right, and as I 
uh, leader of housing at ARP, I know how important that focus can be that a, a social mission organization can uh, bring. Uh, and we've run out of time to talk about the role of the federal government and other government agencies, but I know that's uh, crucially important uh, uh, as well. And, and really, we need all those partners in, in part to, to play a role here. Uh, We've run out of time. This is an amazing conversation that could go uh, much further, but I want to thank uh, my panelists for joining me today to talk about these issues um, and want to thank you all for, uh, for joining us for this discussion. It's now time to break for lunch. Our programming will resume at 1.35 p.m.